Fiber is my favorite vitamin. I call it vitamin F. And so like basically as a gastroenterologist, fiber is really important to me. So you're right. 97% of Americans do not get enough fiber. That's like, I feel like protein is like the most, like everyone's always worried about protein in this country. Like nobody has ever hospitalized or has issues with protein deficiency in the U.S. And so like, or very rarely, I should say. And uh, fiber is just one thing. We should be getting about 35 to 40 grams of fiber in our diet every day. And on average, we get about 10. You know, we used to screen starting at for average risk colon cancer screening at age 50. Now it's 45 because we've seen a rise in especially rectal cancers in younger patients. And I'm, you know, now uh, colon cancer cancer is, I believe, the number one killer of men under 50 at this point. And so um, number one ca cancer killer of men under 50. And Our guest today is Dr. Supriya Rao. Dr. Rao is a gastroenterologist that is interested in moving beyond just treating symptoms and addressing root causes. She is quadruple certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology, obesity medicine, and lifestyle medicine. Her overall focus is health and wellness. She has an undergrad degree from MIT and has a medical degree from the Duke University School of Medicine. She did her internship and internal medicine residency at the University of Pennsylvania and a gastroenterology fellowship at Boston Medical Center. She now works with integrated gastroenterology consultants in Boston. I think you'll really enjoy today's interview. Dr. Rao, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on today, Lee. Good, good. Um, we, we appreciate you being here. So you are quadruple board certified, which is amazing. Um, so, so it's an unusual combination to be a gastroenterologist also interested in obesity and lifestyle medicine. How did you get down that path? Sure. So, um, you know, when I came out of gastroenterology fellowship, I just figured I would be a general gastroenterologist. I was in a private practice. I was interested in um, gut motility and how, uh, you know, our overall gut, how it functions and um, ensuring a healthy gut. But uh, over time, I started seeing a lot of patients with fatty liver disease. And oftentimes, um, the primary care physicians would say, oh, this patient had an incidental finding of fatty liver on their ultrasound, or this patient now has got some abnormal liver enzymes and can you work it up? And oftentimes it would end up uh, being uh, fatty liver after everything else was excluded. So, you know, with fatty liver, you know, right now there's no good medication to treat it. And we uh, were just kind of like, at that time, there was no good medication to treat it. And we would just say, okay, uh, for these patients, you really should you know, make sure you're losing weight. And so diet, exercise, and we'll come back in six months and see how you do. And that obviously was not a really great uh, prescription for patients because it didn't really give them like the tools to really help them with weight loss. And so I found that I wasn't uh, doing right by these patients. And so over time, I said, you know, this is kind of all uh, overlapping with obesity and obesity medicine at that point was kind of a fledgling field. And so I went to some conferences, learned more about it, and finally decided that I wanted to get uh, sort of certified in it to really feel like I had the knowledge to back up what I was doing for patients uh, regarding obesity medicine. So in 2020, I became uh, board certified in obesity medicine. And, um, you know, as we know, in the last year or two, the medications that have come out for weight management, all the GLP-1 agonists and um, GLP-1 GIP agonists that have come out have uh, really changed the landscape for obesity medicine. And so it's an exciting time, but it's also kind of a crazy time uh, with med shortages and insurance issues and whatnot. Um, and then after that, I realized also that, okay, I have medications as one toolkit. Um, you know, I have other uh, aspects of GI that I can help with uh, patients in improving healthy lives. But then I uh, realized that the lifestyle piece, I think, is one of the most important pieces. It's, again, another tool in the toolbox of being able to promote a healthy lifestyle. And so after that, started going to some of the lifestyle medicine courses as well, uh, became board certified in that a couple of years ago, and just, you know, now I feel like I have that complete, comprehensive way to help patients promote um, healthier, a healthier gut and then eventually just overall a healthier life. Yeah, just to underscore what you're saying about um, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as a radiologist, I would say probably every third or fourth report 
I put a line in about the presence of fatty liver. And my, so you know, the, the estimates vary a little bit, but I was just reading the other day that they say 30 to 40% of people actually have it. I don't know. Do you know what they base that on? Like, uh, I, th I think the imaging is probably less sensitive than the actual prevalence, but what are your thoughts? So I think, you know, imaging possibly, um, but I, you know, about 90% of patients who have obesity also have not non alcoholic fatty liver disease. So they're probably mm -hmm. basing it on the estimates of obesity running to be about 40, between 40 and 50% almost now in the U S. And so I think that's probably what they're basing that number on. And so what is like, what's the cause of fatty liver? Is it excess calories? Is it saturated fat? Is it fructose or all of the above? It's all the above, actually one of the biggest. So, you know, obviously carrying excess uh, visceral fat in the abdominal area uh, is what is going to be, uh, give you a higher likelihood of developing fatty liver disease because it's that visceral fat that then goes into the organs itself. Uh, for a normal healthy liver, we have about five to 10% of fat present in it. Uh, and we actually have a machine called a fibro scan machine. And that machine uh, is based on um, sound waves and it kind of uh, measures the elasticity of the liver. And so when we send off these sound waves and it tells us, oh, the liver is very stiff, it also tells us a fat score. So it tells us how much of the liver it gives us a composite score about how much of the liver approximately has fat involved in it, and then also gives us a stiffness score. So for example, if your uh, CAP score, which is uh, the fat score, is a you know over 240, then we know that that is more fat than should be present in the liver. In some patients, we have over 300. That means that 75% of the liver is involved with fat. And then we have these um, stiffness scores as well, which then are a marker of fibrosis. So if your numbers are above 10, for example, you, you're more concerned that there could be fibrosis or scarring present in the liver. And so in those patients, I oftentimes get a liver biopsy to confirm that that's the case. And then that can kind of lead my uh, next steps in therapy, whether it's, you know, really intensive lifestyle measurements or treatment of obesity or, you know, whatever, what have you. Yeah. My, my concern is that, you know, when I mentioned that the liver looks like it's got fatty infiltration is that nothing gets done about it. Right. Um, uh, that it's just ignored, but I think it's a harbinger of serious problems, you know, metabolic syndrome and, and so on. Um, so what is your interpretation of what a healthy diet is? So I think it's hard, right? Because I feel like my, my interpretation has evolved over the years. Um, I previously, I've been, um, you know, vegetarian my entire life almost. And mm. what I thought was healthy in my twenties uh, is definitely not what I think is healthy now. And um, my interpretation has become that a whole food plant-based diet is the healthiest. Um, one that's full of nutrient dense foods uh, as opposed to calorically dense foods. Um, and one that really is like trying to minimize the processing of it. Now, do I have like cake every so often? Sure. But like, I would say that, you know, the 90% of my diet is really um, the whole food plant-based because that to me, I have felt, I've never felt better. Um, my labs have never been better. And I know that this is the healthiest way. And I raise my kids like this as well. So for me, um, you know, a diet that's rich in fruit and vegetables, beans, lentils, legumes, tofu, um, you know, whole grains and nuts and seeds. Um, and I, we don't drink soda. Uh, actually, you had asked about fatty liver, uh, what causes it. And so it's like, yes, a diet that's heavy in saturated fat, but actually like sweet, sugar sweetened beverages are like one of the main culprits that we find uh, in patients with fatty liver. Um, and yeah, so drinking water, minimizing, you know, alcohol, things like that. Those to me kind of are a signal of a healthy diet. Yeah. What's your strategy like in the office to sort of convince people what the diet you're describing? And I mean, it's pretty much the same diet that we eat is radically different from how most people eat. Like it's just completely radically different. What, what sort of strategies do you use in the office to sort of convince people to embrace that? Yeah, I still feel like I'm on the fringe in a lot of ways, um, even being in like a kind of an East Coast metro city area. I feel like um, it's really difficult to change people's habits, habits that they've had since they were children. And, you know, maybe culturally, that's what they were raised on. And it's hard to break a lot of those habits. But it's funny because actually meat entered the diet regularly only about 100 years ago, I would say, or even less than that. Meat, meat, meat used to be something that was more of a like uh, kind of a special dinner. And it was not something that was incorporated into every single meal at all times. 
And so you and people say, oh, meat is really big part of my culture. But if you look back at the cultures, you know, way back at the cultures, most of them were plant based as in origin and meat would be something that would be an occasional thing. But it's hard to talk about history in that sense, but like, because we're living in now, but um, I actually run lifestyle medicine classes in uh, my office and uh, it's through the Lifestyle Medicine Institute. And it's a a 12 week course, 18 classes, and we meet as a group. um, And we, I run several classes kind of um, concurrently uh, throughout the week. And basically we get to the evidence about the food. And so we, I, I can tell people, oh yeah, that's the best diet to eat. You should be doing this, but why? And so we talk about the reasons why eating this is good. And then we support people through it. We give them a cookbook to like help them kind of um, figure out some recipes. We really troubleshoot. Oh, I like tried tofu. I didn't like it. How do I do it? And so like, you know, we, we give, we do that. And then patients are finding they're losing the weight. They're coming off their blood pressure medications. They're reducing the amount of insulin they have. And it's because they've started changing their diet. And for them to see those changes in real time is the best way for patients to be like, okay, even if I don't fully embrace all of it, if I can get them to even get, you know, 50% of the way there, I feel like I've made a difference because then I know their LDL is going to drop, their hemoglobin A1C is going to improve. And so that to me is how I do it. It's hard sometimes in just like a standalone 20 minute visit to discuss all of these things, which is why if people are even show an interest of wanting to improve their health, I refer them to these classes that I teach after hours because there I feel like I have more of a chance and a platform to discuss uh, why these diet, this, this type of diet is the healthiest. Yeah. Well, that's great that you're doing that. Um, you know, one thing that I uh, tell people is um, you may not like a certain food, but after being exposed to it several times, you might start to like it. I right. think it was Dr. David Katz who says is that we don't um, uh, eat what we like. We like what we eat. And as time goes on, our, our taste can change quite quite a bit. Now, uh, tell me, I, I gather that the average American is really deficient in fiber. Why is fiber so important? Fiber is my favorite vitamin. I call it vitamin F. And so like basically as a gastroenterologist, fiber is really important to me. So you're right. 97% of Americans do not get enough fiber. That's like, I feel like protein is like the most, like everyone's always worried about protein in this country. Like nobody has ever hospitalized or has issues with protein deficiency in the U S and so like, or very rarely I should say. And uh, fiber is just one thing we should be getting about 35 to 40 grams of fiber in our diet every day. And on average we get about 10. And so fiber is really important uh, for our diet because that fiber, when it interacts with our gut microbiome, which are all the microorganisms that are present in our gut, it creates these short chain fatty acids and other helpful substances, which have downstream effects for reducing inflammation, maintaining the integrity of our gut, improving our immune system, uh, and just overall gut health and whole body health. And so fiber is just really, really important to maintain gut health, but also like ensure that you have good bowel habits, regularity, good gut motility. So it has a lot of downstream effects. And these short chain fatty acids like butyrate are just so important for our overall health as well. Yeah, I understand if you do a lumbar puncture on people, you can actually find the butyrate in their spinal fluid. You know, yeah. So it's getting (laughs) your whole whole body has that anti inflammatory effect throughout your, your entire body. Um, Now, what do you think about this craze right now? called the carnivore diet, where people are eliminating all plant food and just eating meat. I, I have no words, I guess. I I don't know. I just, it's really hard to like even fathom people just eating meat all the time. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine what they're like, just the bowel habits associated with that. And also just the amount, like, I mean, I think in the short term, people may see a decrease in uh, LDL, which is common, but over time, the amount of inflammation that's going to occur, the atherosclerotic buildup and everything, coronary artery disease that we will see, it, it, I think, you know, unfortunately, I think it's an ill-advised diet. Yeah, I, you know, I totally agree. And um, uh, it's, it's a little discouraging because when you go on social media, some of these advocates have huge followings. Hundreds and- of thousands of <clears throat> followers. Yep. Yeah, and we'll we'll post a video of something about you know the importance of plants or whatever, and then we'll, they actually the carnivores will chime in and just say, "Oh, you're wrong." But uh, the way I, what I think is going on is that the carnivore diet is an extreme form of an elimination diet, and things that may have been bothering people, you've eliminated them. And you know, one thing you got to keep in mind is 
42% of the calories that people ingest in the United States are refined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Just getting that out and having this mono diet, we have limited choice. You're going to eat less. You're getting those refined carbohydrates out. And I think it's probably true that these people do actually feel better, but it's short-term thinking though, because right. you don't know, you don't know what's happening to their arteries. Exactly. So like you said, short-term, you're right, because you're eliminating things, the refined carbohydrates. Actually, the number one vegetable that um, Americans get are potatoes, often in the form of French fries. And so like, yes, if you're eliminating the French fries, if you're eliminating all baked goods, refined sugary foods, that I would say to emulate, eliminate in general. But if you're doing that in this carnivore diet, yes, you're going to get rid of some of that inflammatory issue. And you'll see like, no matter what you do, if you change something up, your body's going to react, especially in the short term, it'll change. But then to be able to sustain something like that is almost impossible. And, and over time, we don't know what the, we haven't seen the long term um, effects yet in, in patients like this, but I imagine it will show worsening atherosclerotic disease and um, coronary artery disease, general issues with uh, heart disease. Well, you know, of course, you have the Inuit and the Ma the Inuit and the Maasai. They do extremely meat heavy diets, and they're sort of held up as the poster children of you know a low carb meat based diet. But they're actually not very healthy. They don't live very long. Mm -hmm. um, bo both those populations only have a life expect expectancy into their forties. Uh, um, so yeah, it's an uphill battle because I think people like to hear. You know, they want to embrace the things that they like to hear, uh, but it's not a good long term strategy. Um, now, yeah, like you said, as David Katz said, like you, you want to like, you like what you want to eat what you like. And so that kind of fits into that whole paradigm as well. And so I think, you know, if someone's saying on social media, oh, eat all the steak, eat all the butter, eat all these things that, you know, you end up liking and to be like, oh, yeah, it's like, you know, a form of keto. I love keto. I can eat all of these foods that but then the sustainability and just the long term effects, you know, it's just it's not good. Yeah, well, I used to, you know, before I sort of saw the light about the importance of plant-based diet, I used to eat an extremely meat-heavy diet, you know, tons of cheese and whatnot. And I looked great and I felt great. Um, uh, I felt fine. But, you know, my cholesterol was 330 and <laughs> and I was actually, uh, you know, pre-diabetic and that completely corrected once I changed my diet. Um, now, here's something, you know, I'm, I'm interested to ask somebody like you that really knows what's going on. What are your thoughts on both bariatric surgery and those GLP-1 agonists? I mean, there's part of me that just wants to say, like, just clean up your diet and you'll probably get better. But, but on the other hand, these things, these interventions have been shown to improve diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, um, and prom promote weight loss. I guess m my ideals may not be consistent with, with the real world. So what do you think is the proper role for those interventions in managing people with diabetes and overweight? Right. So, you know, I work as part of a comprehensive weight management center, which includes surgery as well. And so I do think there's a place for surgery. I do think that in patients who, for whatever reason, um, just cannot seem to, uh, if, and if they've tried multiple modalities and if they've really gone through a, an extensive lifestyle medicine kind of uh, program and they're still having issues, then I think, you know, especially if they have diabetes and other kind of comorbid conditions, I think surgery does have a place. Um, and then in patients who, you know, I'm seeing now, with, you know, who are on Ozempic, Wigovi, uh, Manjaro and Zepbound and all these GLP-1 medications, and even those who are on some of the earlier um, anti-obesity medications like Phentermine and Topiramate, um, these patients do well as well. But I think, you know, it's really trying to just to say, like, you know, clean up your diet, really look at the lifestyle piece. It does help, but in a lot, and some of these patients, it's just not the only thing that's going to do it. And so I think having that comprehensive thing is important. There are actually a lot of patients who, you know, go through the lifestyle medicine program we have and lose, you know, 30, 40 pounds and like do really well. But then there are a lot of patients who need um, to lose like 200, 300 pounds. And I think it's really hard um, sometimes with just lifestyle to do that. And so having these uh, tools as well is really important. Yeah. It, the social environment may be part of it too. I mean, if you're living in a family where everybody is eating a standard American diet and then you have these health problems, it's, it's hard. I mean, really you have to change the whole family, um, it, you know, which is not easily done. I think that's a really important, I think that's a really important point to make because in our lifestyle medicine program, we really say that it like, having a support uh, group 
uh, or a support system in place is very um, important to your success. And it's okay if your plate looks different from a family member's plate and just kind of coming to terms with that. And if you're going to a function and you really, you may have to eat before or bring your own food or kind of alter how you would normally eat. Um, I think that's what we kind of reinforce that support system and being different is okay. We've had Dr. Furman on the program and he is a big fan of sort of an inpatient setting, ideally where people stay at his facility for uh, at least a month at a time so that they're getting exposed to nothing but good, healthy food. They're, they're changing their, their habits and um, also developing a new self image where, you know, health is an important part of who they are so that when they go out into the real world, they have the, uh, the strength or what, or identity or whatever, to be able to continue to eat healthily. Um, but you know, it's, it is difficult because, um, you know, we're in rural Iowa and we, we moved here just fairly recently and we thought things were kind of bad in Minnesota, but it's actually even worse here as far how common it is for the eat, people to eat poorly and to be overweight. And, um, it's, uh, really kind of unfortunate. Now, when it comes to fiber, it, um, uh, tell us, talk to us about like the diversity of fiber. Is that something that's important or can you get it all just from one source? Can you just take a supplement or? How should you yes. approach that? So uh, I, the basically the American Gut Microbiome Project looked at, you know, the best way of, um, you know, maintaining a healthy gut. Well, how much fiber do you need? Like, you know, what sources should you be looking at? And basically they kind of uh, landed on eating 30 diverse plants throughout the week would be enough to uh, maintain a healthy gut microbiome as well as a diverse one. And that's really important. And actually kind of hearkening back to what we were discussing about elimination diets, when you're eliminating um, whole uh, groups, whole macro um, nutrients, then you are really eliminating a lot of, you know, your diversity in your gut microbiome. And so the fiber is really important, like I mentioned earlier, and having, you know, good sources of soluble and soluble, we need both. Um, if you feel like you cannot, like you're getting up into the 20s in terms of the amount, 20 grams of fiber, and you need a little bit more extra help, but you feel like I'm eating all the vegetables I can, then adding in a fiber supplement is fine. But I would um, recommend getting as much as you can from prebiotic uh, fiber sources. Um, and all the fruits and vegetables have good amounts of fiber in them. But if you need a supplement, like, you know, the over-the-counter things like Benafiber or Metamucil or something like that, that's fine as well. Yeah. Now, when you have somebody that's been on a fiber poor diet um, and they try to go on a high fiber diet, you know, GI upset is a common complaint. And uh, one of the things I see on these carnivore uh, social media platforms is people say, oh, well, you know, if I eat if I eat fruit or eat, you know, vegetables, I get GI upset. So I just go right back to the carnivore diet. I mean, I, th I think probably what's going on is they've lacked they lack biodiversity in their their gut and they've got to replenish that. What do you recommend to those people? For those people, yeah, and you're, you're totally right. Their biodiversity has kind of been uh, completely altered and uh, decreased. And so for those people, I mean, I wonder oftentimes if they're swinging from one extreme to another. So like, you know, all meat and then all of a sudden you're trying to like, okay, I need to eat vegetables and fruits and then trying to do that. I think it's really important to like uh, introduce those foods slowly to allow your gut to kind of adjust. And if you do have some bloating or discomfort, um, just kind of managing it um, as you can. But because, you know, for my patients who are in those lifestyle medicine programs that I teach, they are now going from like a very meat and kind of potato heavy diet to starting to add in some fruits and vegetables. And then the first week they're like, oh man, like I'm getting some bloating. It's, you know, I can definitely see a change in my bowel habits. And I'm like, okay, just push through it. It'll be okay. Um, and just try not to add it all at one time. Like we kind of talked about slowly adding some of these foods in and by week three, they're fine. So if you give yourself like some time, and uh, slow introduction, I feel like that's the best way of reintroducing fiber into your diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we talk, you talked briefly about protein, and this, this is a common bugaboo. And, um, you know, years ago when I heard about eating plants, you know, I was, you know, big into weightlifting and stuff like that. And I was eating meat four times a day at least. Um, and when I heard about the idea of eliminating all meat, you know, that's crazy where you're going to get your protein. Uh, talk to us about sufficiency of protein um, and for the average person and also for somebody that is more um, uh, athletically inclined and working out. Sure. So, um, you know, I've actually just started, I have started to undergo this like weight training program myself. And I was looking at like my protein um, kind of intake. And, um, you know, I think 
in terms of getting plant-based protein, I actually have no difficulty doing it. I'm able to get all my protein requirements in a day. Uh, and I'm able to get it from, you know, tofu, beans, lentils, um, you know, other soy products. Um, you know, there are some vegan protein powders that I use sometimes um, that's just like straight uh, pea pow- uh, like pea protein powder and things like that. So I actually have no difficulty at all um, getting to my protein um, sources. And, you know, for the average person, I mean, I think we say anywhere from like, 1.2 to 1.5 uh, grams of protein per kilogram is what we're trying to aim for. Uh, and yes, if you're eating like a slab of meat, you're going to be able to get that more readily uh, or more easily, but you're also getting all of the inflammatory components of eating the meat, the saturated fat and all of those things. And so with the plant-based sources of protein, um, it's kind of, you know, peeling away all of that and you're just getting, you know, higher quality protein in my, in my opinion, actually. Yeah. Well, I, um, I've, I've worked out sort of my whole life and back late summer last year, I, I changed my workout to sort of more uh, focus on developing strength. Mm-hmm. And I've actually gained, and I eat a completely vegan diet. We don't consume any animal products at all. Um, I've gained 17 pounds since last summer. And of course I was getting alarmed at, you know, how much weight I've gained. Um, so just about a week ago, I went for a body composition test uh, with a DEXA scan. And uh, despite that 17 pound weight gain, I was still on the third percentile for uh, body fat, not 3%, but third percentile. Sure. sure. Um, now I had it measured, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. At that time it was zero percentile. Um, so I maybe gained, you know, a little bit, but, uh, but since last summer, the majority of what I've gained is pure muscle eating nothing but plants. Um, so, so that should allay people's concerns. I do once in a while um, uh, have a protein shake with pea protein. It's a mix of pea and rice protein. Sure. sure. And it's actually quite tasty. Um, yeah. It doesn't have any bad, you know, a- additives in it. Um, but it's just to reassure people that you can indeed get enough protein without it consuming, yeah. you know, any meat. And if you look at a gorilla who's genetically extremely similar to a human being, they're eating nothing but uh, leaves and fruit and occasionally some termites, you know? Um, so, and, and then of course, you know, by not eating any animal products, you're not getting the heme iron and the TMAO and right. the saturated fat and that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I was just going to agree with you. And, uh, you know, we have an, we have an in-body uh, machine in our office, a body composition, and we tell patients that as they are, uh, you know, transitioning to eating more plants, making sure um, that they're also strength training to be able to maintain their muscle mass as well as, you know, with this plan. And then the patients are seeing a decrease in their fat mass, but it either a maintenance or increase in their muscle mass when they're doing this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a, something else I'd like to ask you about sort of changing gears. Uh, talk to us about screening uh, for colon cancer in particular. Sure. Uh, just yesterday, actually, um, I saw two brand new cases of colon cancer, one in a 50 year old with just a massive hepatic flexure uh, cancer. And then the other one uh, was uh, in a 55 year old uh, with a, like a large polyp. You can actually see it on the CT, a large polyp and an annular mass uh, that had been diagnosed by uh, endoscopy as a cancer. Um, and of course it raises a question, could these have been prevented uh, with screenings? And, you know, talk to us about how, uh, the prevalence of colon cancer has increased in young people and the changes in the recommendations. Yeah. So, um, you know, now uh, the changes in recommendations as of a couple of years ago at this point, the American Cancer Society and all of our GI uh, societies have declared that, um, you know, we used to screen starting at for average risk colon cancer screening at age 50. Now it's 45 because we've seen a rise in especially rectal cancers in younger patients. And I'm, you know, now uh, colon cancer is, I believe, the number one killer of men under 50 at this point. And so um, number one cancer killer of men under 50. And, um, you know, I have been seeing cancers in patients as young as in their early 40s. And so it's obviously there is a shift. Um, I think, you know, we're all trying to understand what the reasons are. We think it's likely multifactorial, but lifestyle having a big piece of it. We are like a very animal protein, meat heavy uh, diet, you know, the standard American diet, very sedentary. We don't sleep well. We're all stressed out. It's like all of these different aspects of our lifestyle are really unhealthy. And that's just promoting, you know, likely in like inflammatory changes within 
our gut, which then eventually leads to uh, polyp formation and cancer formation, along with obviously genetics and you know whatnot. But since we're seeing it more often, they they reduce the uh, screening age to forty five, um, and yeah, I mean like the amount of rectal cancer that we're seeing in younger people, I think jumped like twenty percent or something. So you know in the last decade, so it's just been really uh, kind of frightening. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, as, as far as screening goes, uh, what do you advocate for screening? For screening, I definitely as advocate col uh, is colonoscopy because it's the gold standard. When we do a colonoscopy, mm -hmm. we're able to see the entire lining of your colon. We even go into like the, the last like, you know, few inches uh, or centimeters of your um, small bowel, the terminal ileum. So we're, and we're able, we spend a lot of time, you know, eight to 10 minutes coming back, looking around each fold to look for polyps. You know, a lot of people are worried about colonoscopy. There's always like this kind of like negative, you know, view about colonoscopy, whether it's doing the prep or getting concerns about it being painful or just the procedure in general. It's a very safe, uh, you know, well-tolerated procedure. Uh, and I talk to patients about this at length um, when I'm talking about just like colon cancer awareness. Everyone talks about, oh, but I did the stool test at home and it's fine. But oftentimes those stool, I, those stool tests I've proven wrong multiple times, including like finding multiple polyps or even finding cancer in stool tests that are negative. And so I don't trust um, those at all. And I recommend colonoscopy and in younger patients, even if they've had a couple episodes of bleeding, you know, previously I would have thought that, Oh, it could most likely just be hemorrhoids. But mm -hmm. in my experience, I've found cancers or large, large polyps that have been bleeding. And so I uh, don't take any chances in that way because you know, colonoscopy is a safe, effective uh, screening and it does save lives. And so that to mm -hmm. me is the best way of uh, getting your screen, your cancer screening. Yeah, I, I've had, you know, uh, screenings done a few times and, um, uh, you know, I can just assure people that the procedure itself is no big deal. In fact, the last time I had it done, they stated me, I had to just take the word for it that they even did it. Um, <laughs> the, the big thing was the prep. I mean, there, there's yeah. no doubt that that's an inconvenience. But um, now there is a school of thought out there. I just took a look, a little bit of a look at this a um, uh, couple of days ago, not in super depth, but the uh, Nordic study, you know, looked at tens of thousands of people, followed them. They had a screen group and an unscreened group. And the conclusion was, is that the screening was effective. But then there was there's sort of this other school of thought out there that the difference was not significant. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, there was a large number of people that missed their screenings in the screened group. Um, so uh, what's your take on the whole thing? Do you think that the Nordic study actually confirmed the value of screening or not? Uh, I don't think it really gave changed the way I thought, honestly, um, because like you mentioned, people missed it. And then also I forget like what the um, like how like how homogenous their uh, like, you know, group was in terms of just like overall demographics. But it, it hasn't affected the way I think about colonoscopy. I've saved several lives with early detection. And so I don't feel that like, you know, get doing away with screening colonoscopy is not the way to go. So. so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, then I'll get my screening colonoscopy in a few yes. years when I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, I, I've never had any real problems with um, uh, uh, adenomatous polyps or anything like that. Now, what about inflammatory bowel disease? You know, that's fairly common. Um, you know, when I went to med school, it was like, we have no idea what causes this. Um, what do we know about the causes and are there natural ways that it can be treated? Uh, I think we still are like trying to figure out all the causes. Um, I think that there is, you know, there is some data, which is still not like, you know, great data, but like talking about antibiotic, um, you know, exposure uh, at younger ages, certain medication exposure at younger ages, disrupt like microbiome disruption. Um, but the, the data is still not great. But again, it's one of these multifactorial things that we don't know exactly why, but we do know that um, lifestyle does contribute to it. Um, and in terms, you know, I have a lot of patients who actually ask me about natural ways to treat inflammatory bowel disease. And, you know, I'm pretty, um, you know, I was, I went through Western, like, you know, medical education, everything like that. So when I see bad inflammatory bowel disease, I'm treating you with medication regardless. Um, and when you get into remission and let's say you are on, uh, like a five ASA treatment, like, which is the minimal treatment, um, or the like least, uh, you know, side effect treatment for these patients, um, 
And if you are on that, and then I talk to you about like the plant-based diet and all the lifestyle measures, if you start adopting that, then after a while being uh, stable on medication, I start thinking about, okay, what can we change here? But the moment, you know, symptoms come back, then I'm putting you back on the, um, you know, full dose of the medication. Um, and for patients who require biologic therapy, in my mind, they're most always going to require biologic therapy to that to say, like, you know, a lot of patients who have inflammatory bowel disease do have kind of IBS overlap as well with infl with uh, irritable bowel syndrome overlap. And so kind of changing to a healthy lifestyle really does uh, get rid of a lot of their symptoms. Does it cure their IBD? Usually not, but um, it's definitely something that can at least alleviate mo almost all symptoms. So I highly recommend that you follow kind of a plant-based diet. If you, if you have somebody with Crohn's disease, um, mm -hmm. Uh, what about, is the fiber an issue? Because some of those people may have strictures. Does that cause a problem? Sure. So if you have uh, active strict stricturing Crohn's disease, I don't really recommend like a super high fiber diet. It's only after that issue has been addressed, whether through surgery or other, you know, modalities, do I then recommend it? Because then you're worried about like, uh, you know, bowel obstruction and things like that. And oftentimes in an active flare, I don't really recommend a high fiber diet because that can actually be, you know, pretty painful. But once you get back into remission, then I'm uh, telling patients to go back to their high fiber diet. Are, are there any like studies at this point, any trials showing improved outcomes of people uh, changing to a more plant-based diet? Has that been objective? I, 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 I don't think it has been. I know they're like looking at like the simple carbohydrate diet and like Mediterranean and things like that, that they're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, I, I don't think the data has actually been shown yet. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Something to keep our eyes peeled for. Yeah. Now, anecdotally, is I, have to say, that... <laughs> I was saying anecdotally, like my patients who are on like a less processed diet, you know, and again, these are, these are just end of dozens, I would say, feel, feel much better than they were previously on their <laughs> an, animal heavy diet. So. Yeah. Now is gluten something that everybody needs to be worried about? Uh, gluten is one of these like hot trendy topics. That's, uh, it's funny. Um, so if you are a celiac, if you are a patient who has celiac disease, then yes, you should not be ingesting gluten because, uh, basically gluten, um, the allergy is seen, uh, in your small bowel. So villi are kind of these finger like projections in the small intestine, and they're what are responsible for absorbing all of our nutrients. And so, uh, when you eat a, glu a diet that has gluten and you're a celiac patient, those villi get blunted and then you're not able to absorb. And so often these patients have iron deficiency, anemia, and other uh, vitamin um, uh, deficiencies, have weight loss, uh, they get diarrhea, uh, bloating, all of these issues. And, um, you know, they're like, oh, well, if those are, you know, people can live through GI kind of symptoms. Why should I stop eating gluten? There's also a risk of um, lymphoma if you are a patient with celiac disease and you don't uh, correct that. So for patients with celiac, 100%, please avoid gluten. Do not eat it. Try not to make sure about cross-contamination. Really look at uh, labels. A lot of like sauces and things that you wouldn't think have gluten in them have gluten. Look at what medications you're taking, sometimes in the lining of the capsule, there can be gluten. So it's really important for those patients to be. So, and then there's basically, you know, patients who have maybe like a gluten intolerance. And so those are the patients who, when they eat gluten, maybe they get some kind of like, kind of like a migratory arthritis or just like joint pains or skin rashes and things like that. And for those patients, it's an intolerance. So like, if you stop eating gluten containing uh, foods, then and you feel better, then fine, avoid it. Because then for those patients, like you objectively feel better, your rash disappears, your, um, you know, arthritic pains go away. And then there's, a, there's everybody else who is just trying to like, you know, figure out, oh, should I be stopping gluten because I get a little bit of bloating or this and that. Oftentimes it's not the gluten that's causing it. Oftentimes it's everything else that's present in whatever baked good that you're eating, like the sugar, like other refined, you know, carbohydrates uh, that are causing you to have those symptoms. So Yes, avoid eating those refined carbohydrates, but don't avoid eating like a good like whole wheat thing because, um, you know, you can be actually causing yourself to have a deficiency in certain minerals and vitamins by doing that. So in those three groups, avoid gluten if you're celiac, consider avoiding it if you have a, a, a severe gluten intolerance causing um, symptoms that are uh, objectively seen like rashes or like, you know, joint issues and don't avoid it in everybody else essentially. 
Now, what percentage of population is affected by celiac disease and, you know, non-celiac gluten intolerance? Uh, I think celiac uh, disease in general is not, um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, uh, I actually don't remember, but it's not like a huge percentage. I want to say on the order of like uh, less than 10, but I, I actually don't know the actual number, but the gluten intolerance, I, I think that's hard to that's hard to measure as well because patients aren't really forthcoming necessarily about their symptoms. Yeah. And it's kind of subjective just based on symptoms. Yeah. Is right. Yeah. Now, other than nutrition, are there other aspects of lifestyle medicine that you address with your patients? Yep. Thanks for asking. Um, so in our lifestyle medicine program, we look at the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. The eating is what's talked about the most because eating is something that we do multiple times a day and then everyone has an opinion about food. And so, and food is very like, I think, uh, you know, it's really comforting and calming to people. So that's why we talk about food all the time and has, it has an emotional, it carries an emotional weight to it. But, um, the other things that we discuss in lifestyle medicine are, uh, moving your body, like just exercise, um, in general, we're a really sedentary country. And so I think being able to move your body is very important. Um, the third, uh, the next thing we talk about is adequate sleep and just how sleep affects our health and like all cause mortality. Like if you're not getting adequate sleep every night, adequate restful sleep, um, you know, you're increasing your risk of stroke, heart disease, um, you know, dementia, all of these different diseases, uh, chronic stress and how to manage it and how to kind of be able to, um, you know, not to say like in modern society, it's a very stressful time. So to say, get rid of your stress is like kind of a silly thing to say. It's how do you manage or how do you react to stressful situations is going to be the way that we try and help patients with their behavior. Um, reducing risky substances. So that's just specifically, you know, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, how to minimize all of those um, or, you know, completely eliminate them. And then the last one is what we see in blue zones um, all around the world. And we actually talk about uh, blue zones actually really like looks at all of these pillars as well. But one thing that patients or that people in blue zones have is like a really great support system, whether it's faith based or your family unit or whatnot, or your friend circle, having good, strong relationships is a key. Like humans are social creatures and um, really rely on others for support uh, and through difficult times, through happy times. And so having, you know, at least five people that you can rely on and five people who you have a good, strong relationship with is really important uh, to kind of a healthy lifespan. And we really promote a living, um, having a good health span. So not just a good lifespan, but a healthy lifespan. So our health span is like living long, as healthy as possible without, um, you know, chronic medications all the time and, you know, without, um, you know, being in and out of doctor's uh, appointments all the time. So that's what we stress. So we, each week we kind of focus on a different aspect of lifestyle medicine and talk about, you know, what the data is behind it and why it's important to do these things and come up with goals. Um, so for example, with movement, we say like, okay, you know, some people are like, okay, I'm going to start exercising tomorrow. Okay. What does that mean? How do you really get to the nitty gritty of it and really looking at exercise as something to enjoy and not to fear or dread. So, okay, I want to start walking, you know, so I'm going to start walking Monday, Wednesday, Friday at lunchtime with my friend for 30 minutes and being really specific about it because then that makes patients and empowers them to be like, okay, I can do this. It's a goal that's easily attainable over the next several weeks. And once I'm successful with that, um, you know, moving on to something that I can, you know, that might be a little bit harder than that. And so it's really incorporating teachings of health coaching, motivation, like, you know, looking at intrinsic motivation, looking at what their values and morals are to help them succeed in all these aspects of lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the exercise, um, you know, is an important piece. And, uh, you, you know, ideally, you want to get that what, 150 minutes of moderate activity, I believe is what is recommended yep. more if you Perfect. can do it. Yep. But it only works out to be about 20 minutes a day, you know, um, which which will make a big difference in your well-being. Um, so, right. I mean, ideally you do more and you also do some like a low level activity and some uh, activity that gets you breathless along with some strength training and so on. Uh, but you got to do what people you got to encourage what people will actually do. Um, now, do, what about alcohol is a little bit good for us or should we avoid it completely? I think, you know, everyone wants to talk about the red wine and the benefits of red wine and the reservatrol that's like uh, present in that, but it's actually present in the grapes. So technically alcohol, there, there's no safe amount of alcohol uh, to ingest. 
Um, that being said, I'm not going to take your wine away from you. And so if you have occasional alcohol, I think that's fine. But even just like, um, you know, the, I think the guidelines of saying, you know, two drinks a day for men or one drink a day for women, I honestly think that's too much um, in my, um, just the, the, from coming and seeing what patients like livers are looking like, or, you know, over time, I, I just recommend that people um, reduce the amount of alcohol significantly because it uh, interferes with just like your cognition. It interferes with your sleep. It interferes with all these different aspects of life. And so, um, and when patients like do reduce it, they're like, wow, I feel like so much better. I feel like my thinking is clearer. My sleep is better. Um, and you know, don't in this extra calories, which especially if you're drinking like cocktails that have a lot of sugar in them, it's just kind of extra calories. So I, uh, you know, I tell patients to minimize if they can as much as possible. Yeah, no, I agree. And I gather there's no safe threshold as far as, you know, increasing cancer risk, particularly breast right. cancer. Yes. And then as far as the cardio protection, I gather that that has been sort of debunked, debunked. Um, that it yes. actually, there is actually no, <laughs> yeah. There is actually right. no card cardio protection from it. Um, uh, now, are there any supplements that you recommend that people take or can everything be covered with just a good uh, plant-based diet? There are very few supplements that I recommend. Um, you know, probiotics are a big thing that people talk about all the time, especially in a GI office. And all of our GI societies have come out and said that probiotics actually don't work as well as people think. I mean, in theory, when you're taking like a capsule full of like what's quote, quote unquote good bacteria, you, um, people think, oh, like my gut is going to be healthy, but there's no data to show that it actually does anything. Um, and so, and they're expensive. So I actually don't recommend probiotics for most patients. It's only in very specific cases, um, which is very rare actually. But if a patient is taking a probiotic and they feel good on, feel well on it, I'm not going to tell them to stop either if they feel like it's helping them. Um, other supplements, I really don't recommend. I mean, like I said, a fiber one, if they feel like they can, they're almost getting their fiber goals, but not quite. Sometimes I'll recommend a fiber supplement. Um, B12 is one if you're eating a completely, um, you know, plant-based diet that can get a little lower. Um, you know, my kids love nutritional yeast, so they're putting nutritional yeast on everything. So their B12s are actually fine. But um, I, and if you do eat mainly a plant-based diet, but then do eat some animal products like yogurt and things like that, you don't have to really worry about B12. But um, sometimes if you, you know, we're checking labs and the B12 is a little low, then I'll recommend a B12 supplement. Um, and then like iron uh, in general, like, you know, so if we have worked up iron deficiency, um, you know, iron can often just be um, gotten from the diet. But if patients' irons are really low, then, you know, we can have them take a supplement until like I've changed their diet enough that to be able to wean them off of an iron supplement. Uh, and then vitamin D. I mean, I live in the Northeast and it's like, you know, not super sunny all the time here. And especially for patients who are darker skinned, they're not necessarily getting their vitamin D as they should. Uh, so, you know, uh, vitamin D, I would say would be the only other one, but everything else, um, I, I would say, I don't really recommend. You can get most, almost everything through the diet. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Um, now, do you have any thoughts, like if a person's eating completely plant-based diet, uh, so they're, you know, they're really eating a well-rounded plant-based diet. They're getting the short chain omega-3s, you know, from their, their flax seeds and their hemp and their chia, uh, and walnuts. Their um, yeah. yeah. Is there any, do you, what are your thoughts on taking a supplemental longer chain omega-3 fatty acid, you know, to get EPA and DHA? Like what we do is uh, we take a little bit of algae-based algae EPA oil. and DHA. Yeah. yeah. I think that's fine. Um, do you think that that's necessary or what do you, what do you think? I don't, I think the data is hard to say, honestly, on that. I, but I think that if you take it, it's not going to hurt you or anything like that. So I think it's fine. Mm. Algae oil is, okay. is great. I actually, um, I actually just got an algae cooking oil. So I'm kind of excited to try it and see oh. how, how it is. Yeah. Ooh. I've never even heard of that. Now, speaking yeah. of oil, there's different camps in the plant-based uh, world about whether or not it should be part of a plant-based diet or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's an argument out there that if you even olive oil, you know, there's not that much in the way of micronutrients. Um, it's very high calorie. Um, but then, you know, there's the argument that it's potentially beneficial. The monounsaturates are potentially beneficial from a lipid point of view. Others say, you know, not necessarily what do you think? What do you think about inclusion of oil I, in a diet? I, 
I think uh, it is very high calorie. I think it's uh, very little in terms of like what you actually gain from a, you know, beneficial wise from it. And especially if you're like using oil at high heat, you're causing like, um, like acetylation of whatever you're cooking. And then that can, you know, you know, lead to kind of TMAO or like, you know, just like bad products that are or just products that are and um, acetylation products, which are not uh, healthy. That, which is why I think oil is recommended to not be consumed. I think it's hard sometimes in modern society to like not have oil as part of um, a diet. Uh, olive oil is one of these things where like, you know, you now find that like most olive oils are not truly olive oil and like being able to get like a correct olive oil from, you know, Italy or Greece uh, is, you know, is harder to do than uh, previously thought. Um, but do I have oil in my diet? Yes. So I'm going to try a little bit of this algae oil. We um, use avocado oil um, spray and stuff like that sometimes when we're roasting vegetables. So I think if you minimize the amount of oil in your diet, for us, that's the best we can do in our house. Um, I, I think it's fine. But if you're using like a lot of a lot of oil, it's like, you know, obviously like super high in calories and not much like nutritional benefit. Yeah, that, that's been pretty much our approach is we use a little bit. It's not a, it's not a lot, though. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we, we keep it on the low side. Yep. Well, you know, this has been great. Where do people get a hold of you? Uh, you can find me. I'm on Instagram. My handle is gutsy girl, M D uh, G U T S Y G I R L M D. Uh, you can find me on my website, gutsy girl, Uh, my practice is located in the greater Boston area. It's integrated gastroenterology consultants. Uh, you can find us online at my I G I C.com. Uh, we, we basically are able to offer a whole um, comprehensive gastroenterology experience. We have nutritionists, pelvic floor physical therapists, uh, behavioral, we, we partner with a behavioral therapist as well. So we're kind of like the whole, uh, you know, comprehensive GI show in the whole Merrimack Valley in Massachusetts. Um, I also have a health coaching company. I took a health coaching program through Vanderbilt University. And so it's called Healthy Roots Coaching. You can find us um, online as well. And we're going to be offering kind of our, um, you know, lifestyle medicine course uh, later this year. So look out for that as well. Well, that's great. We'll, we'll post links to all of those uh, in the notes below. Uh, well, you know, we really appreciate you doing this and keep doing what you're doing. And we all got to sort of pitch in and sort of promote the healthy living and healthy diet because, you know, according to Dr. David Katz, 80% of chronic disease, which is most of what healthcare is about, would just go away if people learn to live properly. So, uh, yeah, so thanks very much. Thank you very much. I think, you know, if we are able to like teach patients about this, educate them and actually start at younger ages where, you know, habits are just starting to form. Um, I think that would be the best way uh, for our and, and the, the fastest and easiest way for our society to kind of become healthier. So thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.